welcome to all attendees. It's my pleasure to host uh, George today and uh, being able to introduce you, him to you. Um, so George Garinis is a professor of genetics uh, at the University of Crete, where he's also director of the Department of Biology, and he's been studying DNA damage in all flavors uh, since uh, quite a while, um, and especially with links to aging and also innate immunity. And um, I think this is also what he will speak about today. So he started his scientific career with a PhD in tumor biology at the University of Athens, and then moved to the Netherlands to the department of Jan Hoymakers um, at the Erasmus Medical School in, in Rotterdam. And there he started getting interested in the connection of DNA damage and aging, and especially with unrepaired DNA damage as a causative um, lesion for aging and all its associated phenotypes. And I think you know he contributed to key work from that department, which really established unrepaired DNA lesions as a hallmark and maybe the hallmark of aging and um, aging related diseases so in 2008 he became in independent as a pi at the fourth that it's a, a foundation for research and technology an independent research institute and then he rose through the ranks there and as the university of crete and since 2020 he's now as already mentioned director of the department of biology there um, and, you know, after being especially interested in the connection between DNA damage and aging in the, let's say, early years of his career, he in recent years moved really at the intersection of innate immunity and DNA damage and DNA damage as, um, or unrepaired DNA damage being a reason for persistent inflammation and um, age-related deterioration. And um, his work was recognized by many different awards, as you already heard, he used to be an EMBO Young Investigator, now he's a full EMBO member, and he also received the Friedrich Wilhelm Bessel Research Award by the Humboldt Foundation um, in 2018, I think. So without further ado, George, we're looking forward to your talk on DNA damage and innate immune responses in health and disease. Thank you everyone for being here and for the introduction. Uh, most of the times when we speak of DNA damage, of what we're uh, actually thinking of is the nucleus. But today I'm thinking to actually take you a trip outside the nucleus, mostly in the cytoplasm and many times, you know, quite frequently outside of the cell. So without, you know, spending much time, I would like just to make a brief introduction and consider that DNA repair is nothing new about it. But we actually discovered it already, you know, it has been discovered already in the 60s. Um, and there have been many and important advances from transgenesis to in vivo imaging and omics approaches. But even today, we sometimes have difficulties to explain the complex phenotypes of patients and mice that uh, have inborn uh, uh, mutations in DNA repair genes. And in this context, I would think that nucleotide excision repair, which is a highly conserved pathway from bacteria to mammals, is a quite good example of that. We have about 30 genes, we have several mutations, and even mutations within the same genes that would actually lead to an enormous heterogeneity in patients as well as in mice. So you get patients that get uh, an enhanced cancer predisposition, but you might also have patients that age faster without getting any cancer, or patients that have a mixture of both and a bit of developmental defects here and there. Now, Jan Hui Marcus, as Julian uh, uh, also informed, uh, informed us before about him in Rotterdam, has pioneered the field by generating a number of mouse models uh, with various you know, uh, mutations and various knockouts where we had the luxury and uh, the privilege to study uh, the effect of DNA repair deficiencies in, in mice. So you get mice that like ERCC1, who is actually Z deficient in a structure specific in the nuclease, this is in year C1, age prematurely. Same happens with XPD, which is a helicase of TF2H, a basal transcription factor also involved in DNA repair. And then you also have the classical mouse model XPC, the zero terma pigmentosum mouse model, that if it happens that it gets exposed to UV radiation, it gets uh, uh, cancer. Now I'm gonna focus on year C1. And what we have done here for the stories I'm going to describe is we uh, studied the mouse. And from that one, we uh, realized that many of those mouse models, they show intimate links 
to innate immune responses. There is a link between irreparable kidney damage and chronic inflammation. And I would like to go through this by uh, uh, showing you a piece of data on what happens if you actually knock out your ERCC1 only in macrophages. And there are two types of major macrophages. They can be the circulating macrophages, the ones that come from the bone marrow, and they're replenished every, uh, uh, let's say, six to eight months. Uh, and they're also the tissue resident macrophages. These are pretty much like the, um, uh, the ones in my cochlea or the copper cells, the microglia in the brain or the copper cells in the liver. Now, if you start with the circulating macrophages, imagine that you're going to have DNA damage accumulation because of the DNA repair defect. Uh, uh, in macrophages, but the rest of the body of the mouse will be actually healthy. What happens then? That was the question. And of course, in those macrophages, you can have accumulation of kidney damage, and you see it here on the knockout situation as compared to the wild type by the accumulation of gamma H6, fungi, phospho-ETM, which is a, a major kidney damage sensor in RAT51. And what we see along with damage is senescence, but not but not apoptosis. So cells do not really die when they have this DNA damage, which is quite surprising, but it happens. But then we do see that there is accumulation of lipofuscin, which is a, a senescent marker. This is a pigment which is composed of those lipid-containing residues, which are associated with lysosomal digestion. And then we also see accumulation of, say, beta cal. And then the lamin B1 can decrease, it decreases, you know, gradually, which is actually a marker of senescence in mammalian cells. Along with that, we have seen that there is enormous, uh, uh, profound, you know, uh, 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 development of cytoplasmic stress responses. First, we start with, you know, the dilation of the endoplasmic reticulum. So the, the right panel here is the knockout, the uh, left is the wall type. And we see here, you know, the dilation of the endoplasmic reticulum, the accumulation of LC3 marking the autophagy and also pronounced autophagic activity by means of the P62 here. But also what we see is a dispersal of the uh, Golgi apparatus. So we see this Golgi by means of the GM130, which is a Golgi marker. You see here how tight it is to the nucleus, but then it becomes really dispersed when cells cannot repair it in the damage. To me, all they suggest that the cells are activated and ready, you know, full of proteins that are ready to be secreted. Um, is this happening up on DNA damage alone? So that is, can we actually expose macrophages to DNA damage without being knocked out, just wild types? Can we see the same things? The answer is yes, in terms of the, of the endoplasmic reticulum, the green uh, uh, standing here, the red, the LC3, which marks the autophagy, and also the dispersal of the GM130 the dispersion, sorry, of the uh, Golgi apparatus. And when it comes now to uh, inhibiting the DNA damage signaling, something interesting happens. You can rescue the effect. That is, what if you have DNA damage, but now you inhibit the DNA damage sensor, so you can actually have DNA damage, but you cannot, you're not able to communicate it, you're not able to sense it. So you see that here, up on mitomycin C, you see the dispersal of the Golgi apparatus, but when you actually uh, inhibit ATM, that's what I stands for, then you know the Golgi retracts back to its original form, which shows pretty much the same picture as the wild type. And we can see the same for endoplasmic reticular stress. So this is the GRP78, this is the untreated, it comes up with MMC, it goes down with ATM, not so with ATR. ATR is more for UV lesions, ATM is mostly for DNA breaks. And the same goes also for the autophagy. Up with DNA damage, down when we inhibit the ATM. So you need persistent uh, DNA damage signaling if you want to sustain this response. If you just move away a bit now and we go to the cellular level at the microscope, the electron microscope level, this is how the macrophages look when they're wilded. And in the knockout situation, we see the accumulation of vesicles. You see them here and there, these multivesicular bodies. And then you see that they get this convoluted network of uh, a pseudopodia. And if you look closely within this network, you're going to find these kind of structures. And inside those, you can see those little tiny vesicles, which resemble what we know as exosomes, which have the size of about 50 to 150 uh, nanometers. Now, from that, I go now up one more dimension higher to the mouse model, and I'm asking whether, you know, having damage in macrophages can actually trigger some sort of, you know, a dysfunction in terms of tissues. And one thing we're looking was 
uh, uh, the pancreas in terms of diabetes, let's say. Now, if you want to be diabetic, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you want to know if you're diabetic, uh, what happens is that you inject glucose yourself and after a few hours, you are checking your glucose levels to see whether you have been able to normalize them back to the normal levels, right? Uh, and this is what we do here. The red is the knockout. The, the black is the wall type. So in a normal diet, you have the mice. These are in minutes. We inject glucose, the mice. And then at four months, old mice, you have, of course, glucose spikes up and then gradually goes down. No difference whether you are a knockout or a wall type in terms of, you know, of the dinner pet effect in macrophages. When it comes to the six-month-old, though, there is a, a slight difference, okay? so which is quite noticeable uh, in terms of the exact opposite of what one would expect. Actually, the mice, which are knockouts, are highly responsive to glucose. They suck in glucose much faster. Uh, uh, in, in clinical terms, it makes them look actually as these mice are actually healthier. And when you put them on an eight-month, the difference is even bigger. You inject glucose to mice, and then immediately, you know, they lower it back and they are much faster to bring them, you know, to lower levels than the wild mouse would. And this is in the absence of any uh, meaningful uh, differences in terms of insulin or the, let's say of ITT test, which is the insulin tolerance test, tolerance test. So there was no problem there. Just the mice were highly responsive to glucose. And in the meantime, we could see that there was a systemic inflammation in virus tissues and virus organs in these mice. We could see lymphocytic infiltrates, so macrophages, lymphocytes would migrate to virus tissues as there was a systemic inflammation in the perinatal fat, in kidney, in lung, in the liver, but also in the wider tissue. And we also have done a lot of, you know, testing with pro-inflammatory uh, molecules like the um, a number of cell adhesion molecules like the PCAM, ICAM, and VCAM. So every panel, every pair here, the right is the knockout, the left is the wall tip. This is for liver, pancreas, and the water repose tissue. Anything red has to do with the cell adhesion molecules, whether it's PCAM, ICAM, or VCAM. Anything green has to do with the CD45 and MAC1, which actually marks the presence of lymphocytes. So this becomes obvious, you know, the reddish picture, to put it this way, for the cell adhesion molecules and the green, you know, infiltrates, the green color infiltrates in terms of the macrophages regardless of the tissue, which wasn't necessarily very clear because for us, it wasn't really clear to understand why one would have systemic inflammation when the problem only affects the macrophages. So we've done an RNA set. We didn't learn pretty much, not much of what we already knew, but we could actually confirm what we uh, uh, have found before. So we knew about inflammation, cell adhesion, vesicular transport, near stress were all actually coming up you know, on the, on the uh, gene, gene expression signature in terms of the senescence and autophagy, it was all profound, at least now we knew the targets. But we wanted to find out what actually those macrophages would secrete and how they list for the response. So the phenotype we had so far was that actually at the cellular level, the macrophages would accumulate in the damage. They would show no apoptosis, but they would senesce. They would have these enormous cell stress responses, cytoplasmic stress responses, and they would actually show this pseudopodia with those extracellular vesicles. We call them extracellular vesicles instead of exosomes to account also for uh, vesicles of different sizes. Exosomes have a very specific size. And in terms of the, uh, in the animal level, on the animal level, we'd see that these mice would have been highly responsive to glucose. Okay, so then, of course, we've done a mass spec approach here. We took macrophages, bone marrow-derived macrophages. We cultured them for about seven days, walled up and knockout. But then we took the media, not the cells. We uh, 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 concentrate them, run a one DSDS gel. We cut them in pieces. And then to make the long story short, we've done a few mass spec uh, runs. And then we found out that actually rocks and rubs, which are actually a, a rust superfamily of GTP hydrolases, would be enriched in the media. And those proteins are actually involved in those two things, exosome by genesis and the glucose uptake. And we wanted to focus on those two in response to DNA damage and whether there is any link at the animal level. Now, we wanted to visualize the exosomes and to, to see you know, if they're really secreted, if they're really there. And we found out that there are two markers, CD9 and Alex, which mark the presence of exosomes. And we check the sera of these mice and we find that indeed 
they're there, they're present, plus the two uh, GTP hydrolyses that we could see from the mass spec. We also visualize the exosomes, which have the size of about 50 nanometers. We could see them and visualize them in the media of, uh, of cultural cells. We could also see in the culture media of the, of the cells, of the knockout cells, there was an enrichment of those proteins. And we could also see them that they're coming up upon DNA damage. Mitomycin C is a potent genotoxin. So you see here the CD9, which comes up, the Alex comes up, along with RAP10, RAC2, which are the, uh, and RAC1, which are, as I said before, the GTP hydrolysis. And there is a slight reduction when you inhibit ATM. It's noticeable. We see that it goes down, suggesting what we have already seen for the cell stress responses, the Golgi uh, 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 apparatus become, you know, not as dispersed as it was before with damage. And we had also the secretion of interleukin-8 and interleukin-6, which are actually known uh, uh, cytokines, and they're also involved for the senescence-associated secretory phenotype. But we would say it's secreted up and in the damage. So the question we asked with was whether exosomes which are secreted by the knockout macrophages, could promote the glucose uptake in recipient cells. And so every great postdoc in my lab has done a, a, a good experiment, actually a two pieces of experiment. The first question was whether the exosomes which are secreted from those macrophages can target the recipient cells. And the second question was whether the cargo of those exosomes is discharged in recipient cells. Now, the first question, she took the macrophages and cultured them in the presence of a, of a, a, a chromophore like PH67, which actually will color and tag the exosomes. So then it takes the media, the exosomes are secreted. She takes the media, and now the media will contain the PK67 tagged, the green tagged, let's say, exosomes, transfer them in wild-type primary pancreatic cells, or as I would call them later on, PPCs. And she could see, you know, those green dots here in the cytoplasm, suggesting that indeed EVs, the extracellular vesicles, are entering the cytoplasm of recipient cells, of those pancreatic cells. Are they able also to discharge the cargo? She has done a very nice experiment here. She transfected those macrophages with gfp tagged proteins like RAP10, RAC1, which she knew they are packed within exosomes. So if those tagged proteins are packed in exosomes and we can isolate the exosomes from the media of those cells and transfer them in recipient wild type cells, one would be able to see those tagged proteins in the cytoplasm of those recipient cells. And that's exactly what it sees for the RAP10 GFP tagged protein, as well as the RAP1. And suggesting that indeed the exosomes are targeting the recipient cells and they're able to discharge their own carbon. And of course, the major question was, what's the connection to glucose? And what we found out, which was very you know, straightforward and very robust, was that if you actually culture the primary pancreatic cells, PPCs or hepatocytes, in the presence of knockout EVs, EVs which are coming from the knockout macrophages, but not so from the wild type macrophages, glucose, in terms of a 2-NPTG, which is a glucose analog, immediately gets in. And you see this accumulation of glucose. And the same happens if you take those cells and you culture them in the presence of the sera, the knockouts, the, sorry, the knockout exosomes which are coming from the sera, the, the sera of the knockout ones. Or if the EVs are coming from macrophages which are, uh, 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 have been exposed to DNA damage. So sera from knockout mice, whether the exosomes sorry, are coming from the sera of knockout mice, from cells, which are knockout, uh, knockout macrophages or from macrophages, wild types which are exposed to DNA damage, same story, you would immediately trigger the entry of the glucose in these cells. How glucose exactly enters in the recipient cells? Well, it's not really a passive diffusion, we know that. Uh, it's an active transport. And there are two actually glucose transporters, one and three, GLUT1 and GLUT3, which operate in an insulin independent manner. And in both cases, we could see that they are actually upregulated in cells when you expose them to uh, knockout EVs, but also in the knockout mice. You see here in the liver and the pancreas, and we also see here the immunofluorescent staining. And if you take PPCs, water PPCs, and expose them to knockout EVs, like in this situation here, you see the uh, uh, RAP10 comes up, the GTP hydrolase, together with the GLUT1. We do think that they do mobilize, you know, in the membrane. 
uh, uh, and they're really uh, their levels increase uh, momentarily in the cytoplasm, promoting you know, the glucose entry. What a glucose does in recipient cells? What was actually the question here was to find out what's the connection between glucose and inflammation. We found out that glucose itself, uptake, you know, uh, the uptake of glucose triggers the pro-inflammatory response. Now, this is very interesting. We took two markers, INOS, the induced nitric oxide synthase. This is a, a pro-inflammatory uh, protein, but also an F-kappa beta. And we actually wanted to find out whether it is the media or the EVs in the media that do the trick or both that elicit this response. So if you take cells, expose them to DNA damage like mitomycin C, and you expose them to culture media from macrophages alone, you see nothing. If you do the same with only EVs without the media, still you see nothing. If you actually now combine the culture media with EVs, then you see all the response of the induction of the INOS uh, cascade. And that is because the culture media have those cytokines, which we think they precondition the cells. And then on top of that, EVs will do the trick. And we did exactly the same for NF-kappa beta. NF-kappa beta is always there, present in the cytoplasm. And if you expose them to the culture media, the cells, if you expose them to the culture media from macrophages, you can see one or two cells where NF-kappa beta translocates in the nucleus, so it becomes activated. It's a transcription factor. And then if you have only the AVs, maybe there are a bit more cells where you're going to see this translocation of kappa beta in the nucleus. But if you choose them both, then, you know, you see substantially more many cells. Far more many cells, you know, are able to show this translocation of the active NF kappa beta from uh, the cytoplasm to the nucleus. And if you have cultured, you know, the cells at higher glucose levels, the response is even higher. The translocation of kappa beta is a higher, suggesting that glucose levels, in fact, do matter. Now, how exactly glucose promotes this inflammatory response in recipient cells? We know that glucose activates the PI3 ACT pathway, which is quite an old, I would say, knowledge. What we found out here is that it goes through mTOR. And we found out out of checking, you know, all these different targets that it is through the phosphorylation of 4-BP1. It phosphorylates 4-BP1 and through a long uh, cascade, it actually activates translation and through that inflammation. So what we did was to repeat the experiment, but now we use rapamycin to inhibit TOR. TOR uh, is the target of rapamycin. And of course, inhibiting it, you wouldn't be able to see the phosphorylation target like P6K, there's nothing here. And 4-BP1 is not anymore phosphorylated, but also INOS is not anymore induced. And there's actually a very a more interesting immunofluorescence experiment here, where if you expose cells to those EVs, what you see is that glucose ketin, you see those green dots in the cytoplasm, and then NF-kappa beta translocates into the, uh, um, the nucleus, from the cytoplasm to the nucleus. Now, if you inhibit mTOR by means of rapamycin, the glucose still gets in but the NF-kappa beta now remains in the cytoplasm, suggesting that the pro-inflammatory signal, it is indeed mTOR dependent. And we can do that, the whole thing in vivo. You can take now EVs, extracellular vesicles, you can inject mice with, and you can immediately make them more responsive to glucose. Not EVs from MEFs, mice, embryonic fibroblasts, you see nothing, but they have to be, they have to come from macrophages, like the ones you see here, and you see the upregulation of GLUT1. And you can see it also here that if they're coming from MEFs, the injection, you know, uh, the EVs if are coming from MEFs, then if you inject them in mice, you pretty much see no difference in terms of how, uh, you know, fast they can uptake the glucose. But if you do them from, if the EVs are coming from macrophages, immediately you see the bigger difference. You immediately, you know, become responsive to glucose. So somehow the macrophages are able actually to alarm, if you have the DNA damage, the surrounding media, the different cells, and inform them that they have to be really ready for the threat that is coming. And this is one way to do it. What happens now with the uh, macrophages, which are actually tissue resident? Now, these are in the brain. And <clears throat> those that will be repair deficient, they will kill accumulate any damage. And pretty much what you see here is that normally a mouse will, you know, release a spent from a tail. That's a volta one, what it does. But if you actually now have accumulation of DNA damage in a microglia, which is the other type of macrophages, the tissue resident, then the mice paralyze and that starts to become really apart by about four months of age. 
We did the same stainings for gamma 2x to show, you know, whether there is DNA damage accumulation. But we were really surprised to find out that in addition to the gamma 2x accumulation in the nucleus, which you see it here, the green suggests that it is a macrophage cell, a MAC1. We also find out that gamma 2x, in many cases, actually it accumulates in the cytoplasm. And we looked closely and we found that there are many instances where the dopey, the chromatin, is also in the cytoplasm, suggesting that somehow <clears throat> there is accumulation of double strand DNA chromatin fragments in the cytoplasm of these cells upon uh, DNA damage. And it wasn't the only cells we could see there. You can also see it in pancreatic cells, where we have seen accumulation of single strand DNA just in the cytoplasm. We see it in the pancreas, we see it in the liver, we see it in kidney. It's quite systemic, and I would say that it triggers a pro-inflammatory response. We also see it in naturally aged mice. So from two months old to 24 months old, this staining for single strand DNA comes up, and along with that, we have an interferon-like response because cells see this DNA, they cannot really distinguish between self and foreign DNA, and they start, you know, uh, uh, responding to it as it would be a viral infection. So it's a viral-like response. That's how we would interpret it. And we know it's single-strand DNA in this case, because if you transfect, you know, uh, those cells with S1 nuclease, protein transfect the cells, then the whole signal is gone. That's one thing. And we know, of course, that it comes, you know, with DNA damage, because if you expose well type cells, with uh, illudines, but also other genotoxins like UV radiation, immediately you see that single strand DNA accumulation in the cytoplasm comes up enormously if you happen to stay with an antibody against single strand DNA fragments. Now, we know they're coming from the nucleus because, of course, the DNA damage itself, but also because if you inhibit the uh, uh, nuclear export with LMB, leptomycin B, you see that the signal comes down. Like we know that RP70 a protein, you know, that plays a major role in binding uh, single strand DNA, plays a role in actually transporting those cells from, from those DNA fragments from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. Where do they come from and how they are connected to DNA damage? Now, we found out that actually R loops might be one major source. And we know that because of the following experiments. Now, in case you are not aware of the R loops, these are formed with an mRNA, it's actually produced from an RNA pole 2. And this is the five prime. And for a moment, it will hybridize with one of the two strands, leaving the other one unpaired. And so it could actually trigger spontaneous single strand DNA breaks. Now, here you see the accumulation of R loops. We found them in nucleus. There are reports that are also in the cytoplasm. We don't know their origin. But let's focus now for the moment on the blue stain, you know, nuclei here. And we can eliminate them by treating cells with RNAs-H, which actually cleaves, digest the RNA, which is hybridized with the DNA. The question was not that. We knew that R loops accumulate upon DNA damage. The question is, what if we digest those R loops and we actually eliminate them? Do the single-stranded DNAs are also gone? And the answer is yes. So if you actually treat your cells with RNAs age and you eliminate your R loops, the single strand DNA which accumulate in the cytoplasm, they are also markedly reduced, suggesting that cytoplasmic single strand DNAs are likely coming from R loops as well. There may be also other sources. Now, we could say also, also that R loops accumulate in naturally aged pancreata and in livers. You can see it here. Uh, the accumulation and there. And of course, it's gone when you treat those uh, tissues or cells with RNAs age. So, and of course, with that, it comes a robust pre-inflammatory response. It starts with fibrosis. It's an interfering response. And it recruits, you know, the leukocytes at sites of tissue damage, creating a vicious cascade of chronic inflammation. So the question now is, what are you going to do about if you want to actually uh, uh, develop a therapeutic strategy? You have those single strand DNAs, and you know that they trigger a chronic inflammatory response. Is there a way that you can actually eliminate? So we had this experience from the lab of working with exosomes, and we thought about it for a while. And what we came up with was to actually develop a, 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 a strategy where we would pack our exosomes, let's say design exosomes that will be packed with a nuclease specifically for, let's say, single-strand DNAs or, let's say, uh, double-strand DNA. And in this case, what we did, uh, the idea was actually to 
deliver them or administer them in mice as a nasal spray because they can pass the blood-brain barrier. They can go directly to the brain or they can even target the pancreas. But we didn't know if it works. The, the answer, of course, was quite good. So if you have these S1 EVs, S1 for S1 nuclease, this is the monk bean S1 that they just the in strand DNA, pack them in exosomes, inject, you know, or expose cells to those EVs, you see that the single strand DNAs are gone. And this is the in vitro experiment with a marked reduction. And then we actually did the same by injecting EVs packed with the nuclease in mice. And then we see also there was a reduction of S1 nuclease. And of course, with that, we'd see that the inflammation would go down as well. And with that, I would like to summarize and suggest that indeed, I hope I convinced you that there, is, there are many links between the damage and metabolism, between the damage and responses which are actually quite important and are not happening within the nucleus. And there are some ideas also of having some therapeutic strategies when it comes to exosomes. Now, this is the lab. Of course, this bitch is quite close to my lab. Sorry, uh, it happens. That's why we are in Crete. And I would like, of course, to thank everyone that helped us with the finding and also inform you that we're going to have actually a number of workshops on development of circuits in aging, which we organize end of May. I'll be very happy to see you there. And with that, I would like to close and I will be very happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, George, for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, so now there is uh, time for questions and, of course, also answers by George. So please type your questions in the Q&A and then I will read them uh, to George and also to the entire audience. Um, maybe while you do so, I can break the ice and ask the first question. So I was wondering whether you have any insights or speculations on the identity of the actual lesion, especially looking at your first part, right? So, so what this causative, I mean, what are the lesions? What are the metabolites? I mean, what are the ideas behind the actual cause of the DNA damage? So we're thinking, uh, yeah, thank you very much, Julian. Uh, one idea is definitely, we know some DNA lesions that will do the trick. We cannot exclude others. We know that DNA breaks definitely do it. We also know that DNA interstrand crosslinks also do it because uh, mitomycin C, that's what it does. Um, and we are aware also of transcription blocking DNA lesions because of illudines, but also because of the NER defect. So whenever you interfere with transcription, whenever you interfere with uh, uh, DNA replication and transcription, like the DNA interstrand crosslinks, so you have breaks. So these are quite you know, toxic uh, uh, lesions, then you might have this kind of response. I don't know about oxidative DNA lesions. So far, we haven't tested. Yeah. Okay, now I see questions uh, popping up. So let's start for the first question by Elvira Maas. Uh, thanks for the talk, fantastic data. Did you also induce CX3, CR1, CRE during embryogenesis? What is the phenotype there? No, we, we haven't done that. Uh, there isn't, well, there isn't any phenotype in terms of that because this is a mouse that actually, uh, uh, the CRE is expressed since birth. So we don't really see any uh, uh, phenotype there. And now we try to do some extra experiments for the specificity of the 63 CR1 to tissueize the macrophage. So we don't really know. We haven't seen anything. No. Okay, we have a second question by Yi Li Lin. Uh, great talk. Have you compared the compositions of EVs from ERCC1 minus minus MEF and macrophages? And uh, does EV DNA play a major role in this process? Yes. Uh, so for the first uh, uh, question, I have to say that we haven't really compared. It's actually quite a nice idea here. What we have done is to, to do a mass spec analysis of uh, EVs which are coming from macrophages. And I have to say there are thousands of proteins. We got lost. And we stopped, <laughs> it was quite enormous. Uh, we wanted to do it in a quantitative approach that was not instead of a high throughput. And so we, we haven't done any, any comparison yet. Um, I cannot exclude that the DNA might play a major role in this process. If you consider DNA, which comes from um, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the source full cell. So one idea which we could think is this, if you have cytoplasmic DNA, 
um, and then you actually put it in these, and then you transfer it to a recipient cell that doesn't have any DNA damage, do you trigger inflammation? I would say yes. This is, this is a very interesting scenario, and we could see it. Having, uh, you, we should think that these are only a snapshot of the cytoplasm, right? Not the nucleus, a cytoplasm. So if you have cytoplasmic DNA, indeed you can carry it over to recipient cells, and you might instigate a similar response. Yeah. Okay, then we have a question by an anonymous, uh, anonymous attendee. Thanks for the interesting talk. I'm wondering, are the R loops specifically or non-specifically binding to the single-stranded DNA in the cytoplasm? Uh, this is... Uh... Well, I think the question was pointing towards whether there are still R loops or hybrids in the cytoplasm or whether this is maybe purely single-stranded DNA or whether you still have R loops in the cytoplasm. Yes, so it's a very interesting idea about the R loops in the cytoplasm. Uh, originally, I thought it's a background. I, originally, that's what I thought. But um, what we have observed, and we're not the only ones, is that if you actually treat them with RNAs age, they're also gone. So something is there, and something hybridizes, let's say, between a single strand DNA and an RNA. And momentarily, it could be something that we, has escaped our attention, but uh, I haven't studied specifically, so I'm not aware. I, I cannot truly really answer the question because I don't really have any data, but it's a very interesting thing about the cytoplasmic R loops. So I cannot really say much on that. And there's a second uh, question. Do you think this technique can be helpful in targeting cancer cells? Yes, yeah. referring to your uh, S1 nuclease approach. Yes, that's a very, very good question. So carrying a therapeutic cargo specifically to target the cells, I think is a very interesting idea. And we're not the only ones. People are doing it with various nanocarriers, right? I mean, uh, think of Pfizer, think of Moderna, think of the modern vaccines. We all got them, right? Or nearly all. And I would say that, you know, we are using nanocarriers. That's what we're using. And the mRNA therapeutics, the protein cargo, it's the future to go. Actually, those companies were looking for anti-cancer drugs. So, um, yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, more questions coming in. Uh, Melanie Hamon, thank you for the talk. Infection with bacteria notoriously induced DNA damage. Would you expect EV to be released under those circumstances? This is uh, a very interesting scenario. I'm not so sure how exactly. Um, uh, so yes. Oh, so all right. So if this would be secreted as a consequence of bacteria induced DNA damage, yes, yes, that's what I would expect. True. It's very easy actually to release if it's. It's much easier than I thought. It's very easy to secrete them. Yeah. Yes, I would expect that. Okay, further questions. Daniele Facinetti, uh, very nice talk. A question on the last part. You briefly say that there's accumulation of cytosolic chromatin fragments, DARPI positive, so double stranded DNA, and then you move to single stranded DNA accumulation. Is there a link between the two? No, there is. Well, there is, the link is DNA damage. Uh, the first was on microglia. Uh, it's, a, it's a story which uh, we're currently. Uh, uh, you know, going to prepare for submission. Uh, it's a bit actually. Um, and the second one was on pancreatic cells. And I, I wanted to say that, you know, speaking generally about DNA fragments, cytoplasmic DNA fragments, so we do see double strand DNA. We also see single strand DNA. And some cells have a preference for one and others for the other. I have a sense that one, you know, it's more preferable to replication things, and the other one is more to transcription. But uh, I'm not so sure. We haven't done some specifics. Just you know, my my hypothesis. So the link is just the DNA damage for the moment, um, and that was the only thing. So it wasn't any. You know, it wasn't one story. It was like different types of cells, pancreatic cells and microglial cells. Yeah. Okay, Venus Maria Gela. Great talk. Do you think there are specific genomic regions that are sources of R loops, i.e., telomeres, that can generate the cytoplasmic DNAs in ERCCU1? Very interesting, very interesting idea. I'm not aware of that. Uh, it would be nice to test. It would be very nice to test. 
Anna Kayaste, thank you for the great talk. ATM kinase is involved in DNA repair, but you show that inhibiting it rescues your DNA damage induced inflammation. Does this mean that other mechanisms of repair are involved in your model? Uh, no, well, ATM, if we're speaking of the ATM, is in the signaling of the DNA damage response, the kinase, right? It's a kinase. So what we have done is we actually make the DNA damage somehow invisible. Uh, I'm not so sure, you know, all DNA repair uh, pathways are really inhibited uh, when you inhibit the ATM. What we have seen is that you require a persistent DNA damage, active DNA damage signaling. Uh, when it comes to uh, uh, ATM uh, inhibition. So if you inhibit in a damage, then, you know, you have the whole thing retracting back, it rescues, and when, you know, you take away, again, it flies again. That's what we have seen. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a quick follow-up to this because I was wondering this as well, whether you have any insights what happens between ATM activation and EV production. I mean, what is the, the circuit or the regulation there? So, I mean, you see this kind of reorganization of the cytoplasm of, of the ER, of the Golgi of the ER, but you know, yeah. how is that mechanistically driven? A very complex question. We are, uh, we're thinking of the nuclear membrane. We're thinking of the endoplasmic reticulum. We try to find out uh, new ideas. We haven't sorted out because actually it's many pathways. You go from the TNA to the nuclear membrane, you have to go through the ER and the Golgi, and then, you know, you have the secretory pathway. But still, it has this escort thing, you know, to sort out the relevant from the relevant pathway. It's not as easy to uh, to link the two, but that's what we are working on. Yes. Thank you very much. Okay, another question. Uh, have you tested the exosome delivery technique in tumor cells, and do you think it's effective in targeting drug-resistant cancer cells? We haven't. We haven't tested that. Uh, as I said before, uh, I think, well, I think, I just think, you know, I haven't done an experiment. I think it's a very interesting scenario to use that and um, um, others are doing it already so we're not the ones you know uh, <laughs> proving the relevance of nanocarriers or carrying a therapeutic cargo targeted to, to tumor cells then another question by Ramvir Chaudhari on the source of the single stranded DNA so what are the chances these single stranded DNA pop out from non bDNA structures also rather from our loops only these dna fragments can be bound to histones in cytoplasm question mark so this is a second question is there still histones bound to this uh, dna fragments we don't know we don't know we don't know <laughs> we are very open to all scenario all i can say is that one source is likely our loops i'm not so sure it's the only one i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't i cannot you know, exclude any other uh, thing. I don't think these are uh, they're bound to histone. I think, you know, what we have seen that is for double strand DNA, not for single strand DNA, but uh, I might be wrong because we haven't tested. It's just a hypothesis. All this is very new and it's very interesting, I would say. You know, this is the field that works a lot. And I'm pretty much sure, you know, the audience knows that with the sea gas and stink and, you know, these kind of uh, uh, responses. We, as DNA repair people, are not really very uh, familiar with that. So this is starting you know, evolving. Try to connect it to DNA lesion, DNA damage. That's, that's the idea. Okay, I see no further questions, but I think we had a lively discussion. Uh, so thank you all for your questions and thank you, George, for uh, answering all those questions.